and then the Camp Arete garage sale. Uh, a couple of updates. Some of you may not have heard this because I, I was sick last week. Uh, we had rescheduled last, uh, we, we've had a little bit of a fun challenge that the Lord's put our way with the Chafer Conference this year. We originally were, we originally changed the whole schedule, everything to fit Michael Rydelnik's schedule because we wanted to do this very important topic of Messianic prophecy. And then he's had some back problems, and I've heard he, he, and he called and said right at the end of January he had to have back surgery, and that he had was putting that off until the 1st of June, but that because of the uh, uh, having to recover from all of that, he wouldn't be able to come to the conference. So then we uh, ran that by the Chafer board, and they suggested our former Greek professor, Glenn Riddle, who is with BEE Bible Education Extension and te- has been teaching Greek in China for probably the last 50 or 20 years. Very strong guy, solid theology. And so uh, uh, 10 days ago, I had a meeting with Glenn online, and we got everything finalized, and it's going to be a great conference. And then last Wednesday morning, he was killed in a motorcycle accident in Thailand, where they live. And his wife was badly injured as well, a couple of broken uh, broken bones, broken arm. Um, she was unconscious for two or three days. And I haven't had an update until this afternoon. I emailed one of the board members who knew them real well, and I said, what's going on? And then I got 15 emails from the Chafer Seminary secretary who said, oh, I thought you guys were all getting these updates. Sorry, well... I think I skimmed them real quickly, and she's do- Joy, his wife, is doing much better. I think she's still in the hospital. Uh, the, one of the sons and his wife was able to get over there and help out, and the Lord's really opened the doors. There are several believers in the church they were going to there, as well as uh, staff members with BEE who are, who are helping out. Uh, they did not, uh, she couldn't remember anything, so they didn't inform her until, I think, yesterday or Sunday that uh, Glenn had been killed in the accident. I don't think she even regained consciousness till Saturday. So we need to keep praying for them. We have redone the, the schedule for the conference. When I talked to Glenn, we, put, we shifted the emphasis from Old Testament Messianic prophecies, which only Rydelnik could do, to uh, basically dealing with some of the problem passages related to understanding the gospel and clarity of the gospel. And so we just stuck with that theme because there's a new book out called 21 Questions About the Gospel related to some different passages. And four of the uh, contributors to that book uh, are Jim Myers, Mark Musser, uh, Andy Woods, and myself. So we just decided to take the material that we had put together for papers for that book And that would be the uh, keynote evening messages and uh, to put a focus on the gospel. So that's the situation at this point. So uh, there's not really a theme per se other than that. Everything else is sort of a potpourri with uh, different speakers. Tommy Ice is going to be speaking and Andy Woods and uh, Jim Myers and the ones I just just listed as well as um, I think one or two other people but it's going it's, to it's going to be a good conference and the Lord's uh, you know provided a way for us to uh, do that so uh, I think it's going to be good it's going to be interesting to do it in the summer as well because I think more people will be able to come because of the way it's set up so it's going to be Wednesday through Friday June 17th through 19th and more information on how to register will be put on the Dean Bible Ministries website almost as I speak. Right, Barb? It's almost there, almost ready. Okay, how shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. After a few moments of silent prayer, so you have the opportunity to make sure you are in right relationship with God for the study of his word, uh, I will open in prayer. Let's pray.
Uh, Father, we're thankful we had this time to come together this evening to focus upon your word. Father, in terms of those we need to be in prayer for, uh, including um, Joy Riddle and the their uh, children, their adult children, and those who were co-workers in uh, the ministry with Glenn, we pray for them, pray that you would uh, give them the wisdom, the finances, the resources they need to take care of uh, all of the legal things that have to be done, especially when a foreigner and a, another country dies. And Father, we pray that you would open the door for whatever plans they have, that things will uh, run smoothly for them. Father, we know that there were numerous students in China who were dependent upon him, and we pray that you would provide someone who can uh, take his place and someone who would be just as clear, just as precise in the teaching of the gospel as well as teaching of the languages. Father, we pray for George and his uh, recovery. Father, we're thankful that George has uh, not had any regression of the cancer, neither ha- I mean, in any progression, but neither has it regressed any. We pray for his strength. Thankful that he is planning to come to the conference this summer. Father, we continue to pray for this congregation, for our spiritual strength and health, and that we might be a real light in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now tonight we're going to be continuing our study in, in, in background to Samuel. I hope that tonight we will conclude this. I have a lot to cover. But it's important to understand the context of of. Of Judges, I mean of Samuel, because when Samuel begins, First Samuel chapter one verse one, we are in the midst of the period that the Bible describes as the period of the Judges. It doesn't end at the end of the book of Judges; it continues through the life of Samuel. Samuel is the last judge, and when his life or before his life ends. But towards the end of his ministry, the people reject his leadership and demand of him and of God that they give them a king like all of the other nations. And that is really the crux of what the writers of these books, the prophets who wrote Judges, Samuel, and Kings, are demonstrating. It's a key focal point, as I've said before. So we're connecting the books Judges and Samuel uh, again tonight, we looked at this the last time, looking at the uh, first uh, king that was anointed king of Israel, who was not appointed by God, but was chosen by the men of Shechem. That was in the last lesson. He was Abimelech, the son of Gideon. And we saw that that was just a tremendous disaster. And what this is showing is that that the political solution isn't the ultimate solution. That if the people's hearts, if the focus of the people isn't on the right things, isn't spiritually focused in terms of truth, if it's mired in the relativism of paganism, then it doesn't matter what you do in terms of the political solution. It just doesn't work. And that is a message we need to pay attention to. It doesn't mean that we give up. It doesn't mean it's a hopeless situation. I talk to many folks who look at the political scene or the international scene, and they are hand ringers, and they think that, oh, I just don't see how we can get out of this. Well, we can't get out of this, but God can get us out of this. It's been much, much worse in many, many places in history and and throughout the history of mankind, and it was much, much worse during the time of the judges, and we're going to get a peek at that uh, tonight. But it's also a message of great hope because we have to understand the bottom that Israel hit at the end of the book of the judges to be able to appreciate how God in his grace turned everything around and the high point, by the time we get to the end of uh, 1 Samuel, is that David, uh, the answer to the problem, the king who is a, a man after God's own heart, becomes the king of a united kingdom of Israel and leads them to uh, their high point, to the high watermark in the history of Israel with the expansion of the kingdom, 
uh, under himself and under his son Solomon. And so to understand where we're starting in Samuel, we really have to understand the framework of that period of time. Now, this timeline that we've seen before orients us to this time in history. It's in the period between 1000 BC and 1500 BC. The first mark on this timeline is 1446 BC, which is about as close as we can get in determining approximately the date of the Exodus. Uh, After the uh, Israelites were redeemed from slavery in Egypt, because of disobedience, they're wandering in the desert for the next 40 years, and it's not until 1406 that the conquest begins, which takes approximately uh, seven years to 1399 B.C. Following that, you have a period of about 40 years where that generation, the second, which is now the third generation first after the Exodus, the first is the Exodus generation, the second the conquest generation, the third is this uh, consolidation generation, and they have not seen the work of God in the same way their parents or their grandparents saw the work of God, and they begin to compromise. They do not carry out the command of God to annihilate every man, woman, and child among the Canaanites. And this is described in Judges chapter 1, as we see, as you read through the list of different tribes and what they're able to accomplish, by the time you get to the end of that list, halfway through uh, the first chapter, you begin to see that these tribes do not accomplish their task of removing the Canaanites. They're compromising, they're living with the Canaanites, and they're beginning to assimilate into Canaanite culture. And one of the uh, tribes with the greatest uh, record of failure was the tribe of Dan. Now, we're going to focus on them a little bit later on, but this is the tribe of Dan, and they're given an inheritance that is in the area that is about in the in the central area of Israel, in the uh, between Jerusalem and uh, and Joppa along if you've been to Israel it would be in that area uh, along the highway that goes from uh, Jerusalem to Tel Aviv and that area is the area that was originally given to Dan it's right on the edge of the hill country and they're not able to dislodge the Canaanites that live there because of their lack of faith because they've compromised at the spiritual level and the important lesson here politically And pay attention to this. And there are some who are listening to me that really need to understand this. I hear this over and over again from certain people who hold a certain political views uh, that um, we don't need to pay attention to the social issues of the day. We just need to pay attention to the economic issues of the day. They want to be economic conservatives, and they don't want to get mixed up in either the abortion debate or in debates over same-sex marriage or morality, that that has nothing to do with politics. They want to draw a distinction there, as if uh, moral issues and social issues are unrelated. Let's just be economic conservatives. And the reality that God created in the creation doesn't make such a bifurcation. And what God is showing is the spiritual failure on the part of people. Their immorality is what leads to economic, political, and military collapse. It's it's not the other way, way around. It, that you can't disconnect the two. Being a, as we would say today, a moral or social conservative is integrally connected to being an economic or political conservative. You can't separate the two. You can't act as if the moral and social issues uh, can be just taken aside and let people do what they're going to do. The Bible says that these are integrally connected. You can't just operate a political theory on the basis of empiricism alone because no test tube, no social science study can ever uncover the facts that if you turn your back on God and you worship idols, that this is going to yield military failure. There's no way to measure that in the laboratory. So this is our picture, the historical image that the writers of Scripture want us to understand is that failure at the spiritual level leads to failure at the economic, military, and political level. So we have the period of consolidation, which becomes a period of compromise. 
And that leads to the period of the judges. Now, as we look at this, we have the period of the judges. And at the end of that period, the last two judges are Jephthah and Samson. I concluded with Jephthah last time. Jephthah is the one who sacrificed his daughter. And that's important to understand that. One of the images that a lot of Christians have is that just because somebody's mentioned in Hebrews 11 that they were a spiritually mature individual. That doesn't apply to Samson, and it certainly doesn't apply to Jephthah. It didn't apply to Gideon. Gideon was a reluctant spiritual hero. He compromised after he won the battle and led the nation back into idolatry. And it was his son, as we saw in the last lesson, Abimelech, that leads the, the, the Shechemites into further rebellion against God, and arrogantly he wants to become uh, the king of Israel and, and is indeed uh, anointed as the king of Israel. Samson, Samson is a womanizer. He, is, he is, has no virtue whatsoever. He has no integrity. He is a spoiled brat. And that's the best you can say of Samson, except at one point, at the very end of his life, he trusts God for a critical issue. And so God praises him in Hebrews 11. I think I take great encouragement from that, that you can really screw up your life in a lot of major ways, but if you are obedient at a critical juncture in your life, then that's what God focuses on in terms of his praise for your life. And so Samson gets praised for that. It is during this same time period, at the end of the period of the judges, that you have this corrupt, obese high priest named Eli and his uh, two uh, horrible sons who are abusing the women of Israel, Hophni and Phinehas, and that's the end of their uh, of the uh, of the priesthood there, and of their family line. He's going to be replaced by Samuel, and this then leads into the first king, who is given by God because the people have rejected him, and he makes God makes a point clear: Samuel, they haven't rejected you. Don't take it to heart; they've rejected me. I'm going to give them a king that they want. And this is often true. God gives us the leaders that we deserve. Just take that home. He gives us leaders because, especially in a democratic republic like we have, we elect our leaders. They come out of the core of our culture. And the leaders that are elected resemble us. They may not resemble you or me, but they resemble our culture. And Many of us live somewhat isolated lives. If we live in the Bible Belt, then we live in an an isolated uh, area as well because there are a lot of Christians around us. But there are a lot of areas in this country where Christians are few and far between, and they are hated and despised by a large percentage of, of people who live in those areas. Areas in the Northeast and areas in the Northwest, you will have tens of thousands of people who've never, ever met a biblically-based Christian in their life. And all they know about a Bible-based Christian is the distortion they get from a liberal media. And so that forms their opinion. And much of our culture has turned against biblical Christianity. What they're turning against isn't biblical Christianity. It's a caricature, and often it is a misrepresentation based on some extremists But that is what passes for biblical Christianity in our culture. And so we're living in a day not unlike that of the judges, a time of degeneracy and a time of perversion. What that requires of us is even greater patience, even greater grace orientation, and an even greater manifestation of the love of God towards those who and in many people's opinions, just don't deserve it. People who are as far away from God as they can be, who are at enmity, who hate God, but nevertheless, we know that that history is filled with examples of people who were running from God, people who hated God, people who were murdering Christians like Saul of Tarsus, and yet it was the love of God that drew them to the cross 
and they trusted in Christ as Savior, and it caused a remarkable shift. We can't lose sight of the grace of God. And that's the message that I see running through Judges and Samuel. This whole history is the great hope that we have in a God who can change things, a God who can transform culture and transform people if people will trust, trust in him. So Samuel is replaced by the monarchy, Saul, David, and then uh, Solomon. Now, one other name just popped up out of order. Micah is this priest we're going to look at, or this individual we're going to look at tonight, who is important for understanding the background to to Samuel because he introduces uh, apostasy and spiritual and religious degeneracy into Israel. Now, this slide is one we've seen before, just showing uh, that how these judges overlap. Jephthah, Samson, Samuel all overlap. Uh, Samson dies not too long before, uh, about 10 years before Saul becomes, uh, becomes uh, uh, or before Saul is born. So they're, they're very close, very close in time. As we've seen through the period of the Judges, we have this cycle of disobedience, rebellion against God, which leads to divine discipline. After 30 or 40 years, the people uh, cry out to God, and God in his grace always provides a deliverer known as a judge, who's kind of a combination a judicial and military leader who is empowered by God the Holy Spirit, or endued by the Holy Spirit for the purpose of delivering Israel, not for their spiritual maturity. That's another thing that's really misunderstood is the role of the Holy Spirit to the individual in the Old Testament is not in the realm of spiritual growth. It's in the realm of just a few, less than a hundred, maybe less than 70 in the Old Testament have any kind of relation to the Holy Spirit, and it's just to empower them to, to to perform their leadership function within the theocracy of Israel. He gives skill to Aholiab and Bezalel in order to uh, to build all of the furniture and uh, do all the craftsmanship, the jewelry and everything required in the tabernacle. He gave military skill to these leaders, uh, but they're not spiritually mature. They're, they've often compromised to critical areas in terms of their understanding of spiritual truth. They're products of their paganized, compromised culture. But God in his grace has raised him up and gives him the skill needed to deliver the people. So there are these deliverers, and then after they've been delivered for a while, they fail the test of prosperity, and they go back into disobedience. The theme that runs through this section, if we step back a little bit, and we look at Judges, Samuel, and Kings, what you see is that God is showing in, in, in a broad stroke here, that, that, that human beings alone can't bring in the kingdom of God, cannot provide a utopia. It's impossible because all human beings are flawed. If you don't believe that, then you're probably a, biblic, a, a political and theological liberal because that's a dividing point. Biblical Christianity says that everybody is unrighteous. The psalmist said there is none righteous, no, not one. Everyone is corrupt. And that doesn't mean they can't do good things, but that they are corrupt by sin and that only God can change change the situation. And the political solution isn't the ultimate solution. And that these kings are often are often uh, often flawed. And so this is the point in Judges 17, 6. We see this refrain, in those days there was no king in Israel. It's repeated again in Judges 18, 1. In those days there was no king of Israel. Judges 19, 1. There was no king in Israel. It wants us to get the point that because there's an absence of the king who should be God, uh, there's no absolutes, and so they are in Uh, spiritual decline, and uh, they're acting more and more like the Canaanites around them. And so we go through these judges, Othniel, Ehud, Deborah, Gideon, Jephthah, and Samson, and you see each is worse than the one before. It's a spiritual decline. At the end of the book of Judges, the people are acting, as we'll see tonight, no differently 
from anyone else around him. 1 Samuel 8, 5 is a passage I've talked about. I'm going to skip through those verses. But it's Deuteronomy 33, 5. It talks about God. He was king in Jeshurun. That's another name for Israel. When the leaders of the people were gathered, all the tribes of Israel together. When, it, when Judges says there was no king in Israel, primarily, this isn't talking about Saul, primarily. It's talking about God. They've rejected God as their king. And as such... They are turning to look for leadership in all of the wrong places. So, when we look at Judges, it's divided into three sections. The first part, the introduction, is from Judges 1.1 to 3.6, which is an introduction to the book. And this gives us the overview of this cycle that I've just uh, talked about and shows the, the relativism, the moral relativism that plays itself out through the 350 years of the judges and how the people become more and more degenerate because they compromise more and more with the pagan worldview around us. And this is true today. You look at the evangelical church today, and it is a far cry from where it was spiritually 50 years ago because it is compromised. The people, Christians, have compromised more and more with the pagan system around them. Uh, 50 years ago... The vast majority of evangelicals believed in a literal six 24-hour consecutive day creation. Uh, Fifty years ago, uh, they were consistent in their beliefs on inerrancy and infallibility uh, of Scripture and the inspiration of Scripture, but now they're all over the board. Uh, Fifty years ago, they were uh, predominantly pro-Israel. There was always a small segment that wasn't, but we're losing a lot of ground in that area uh, even today because of the inroads of replacement theology and because of the breakdown of a literal interpretation of Scripture and a breakdown in our understanding of inspiration. So we're becoming more and more paganized. In fact, the divorce rate in the evangelical church is higher than the divorce rate among non-Christians. We don't look any different from the world around us because when it comes to how we apply the word we go to church, we restrict it to Sunday morning, and then we go and we live like everybody else during the rest of the week. In Judges 3.7 to 16.31, there's an analysis of the leadership of the people. From Othniel to Samuel, these six judges are uh, evaluated, and each with each consecutive judge, or each consecutive judge, things are worse. The last Five chapters focus on the breakdown among the people and the spiritual leadership. And we see that that you can't just isolate it and say it's a problem of the leaders. The leaders reflect the values of the people. And that's where we're going to see tonight. Just a couple of principles to be uh, reminded of and cognizant of, that when a nation rejects the historical evidences for Christianity— they always become subjective. When you, when you lose sight of objective truth and the evidence for subjective tr- objective truth, the only alternative you have is to base truth on how you feel, to base truth on what you want to be true. The reason that most non-Christians don't believe in God or hate God is because they don't want to pl- God makes the rules, and they don't want to play by God's rules. And so they say, I don't like your rules, so I'm not gonna, I don't believe you exist. That's like saying, I don't like certain rules in the NFL, so I don't believe the commissioner of the NFL exists. It's insane. People want to play, they want a God, but they only want a God that will validate their rules and their values. So when a nation rejects historical evidences and objectivity, it always becomes subjective. Now, subjectivity starts a slide into the morass of mysticism. It's happened that way throughout history. When you get into mysticism, you, you no longer believe there's objective truth, that truth is determined by how it impacts us, how it makes us feel, what we like, what we don't like. We start, you start talking to people and you say, well, why don't you believe that this is true? Well, because that may be true for some people, but it's not true for me. 
That's just pure relativism. Well, why don't you like that? Well, I don't want to talk about it. See, it's very hard to get people to talk rationally about something that is irrational. And mysticism and subjectivity is always irrational. So you can give them evidences for Christianity, but they reject that because they don't believe at the very core of their thinking that you can find truth on the basis of reason and objectivity. They reject that assumption. So it's very hard then to talk to irrational people from a rational grid. And the people, according to Romans chapter 1, what Paul teaches there, the people who reject truth and they're suppressing it in unrighteousness, they have mired themselves in a fantasy world. They have substituted uh, for truth their own wish list of how they wish things really were, and now they're living in that fantasy. So subjectivity always leads to mysticism. And then third, subjectivity in a nation, mysticism in a nation, always leads to the destruction of that culture. There's no hope. Once you get mired in subjectivity and mysticism, you have greased the skids, and there's only one way to turn around, and that is to have a, an interference, an intervention by God into history to reverse course. No culture has ever reversed course from a slide into mysticism in history without God entering in and breaking the cycle. In the classical world, in Greece, you had a major shift from objectivity in the 5th century B.C. to subjectivity and mysticism by the time of Christ. The Romans followed them. What broke the cycle and prevented a complete implosion of Western civilization? Christianity. God intervened into history by sending his son at the fullness of time. It was Christianity that changed Western civilization and brought that Western civilization back to a firm foundation of objective truth. And that's the only time in history that we've seen a culture recover. Eastern cultures have never produced prosperity. They've never produced, uh, they've never produced a high technology. They have never, uh, produced great freedom for their cultures. You think of the great mystical Eastern cultures of India, the Asian cu- countries. They've never been able to bring their people up to advance, to go forward, uh, to build a culture uh, of prosperity uh, and freedom because they have destroyed it in their thinking through subjectivity and mysticism. And they didn't have that intervention of Christ until when? until the 18th and 19th century when Western missionaries brought the truth of the gospel into those cultures. And that transformed those cultures. So India and to some degree China and Japan are what they are today because of the impact of biblically based thinking. Now I'm I'm careful in my choice of words there. I'm not saying that they all became Christian. I'm not saying that they all understood that, but but after Shintoism was defeated in World War II, and and General MacArthur came in and revised the government of Japan and imposed a constitution on them, that cultural imposition came from what? It came from the West. It came from biblical Christianity. That doesn't mean they, they became a Christian culture. But the government was based upon those uh, absolutes that came out of a Judeo-Christian framework. In India, the 19th century, the, uh, the missionaries that went with the, the army of Britain into India uh, transformed that culture, and they learned values, they learned about government, they learned about um, a Western way of looking at things, and that's what brought that culture to some degree out of its uh, morass of of Hinduism and the caste system and everything else. What changed it was was the intrusion of God into that life. But without God, every culture that slips on that banana peel of mysticism goes down and goes down very, very hard. And that's what we see in the book Uh, in the book of Judges, and that's where things are going to be when we start 
with um, start in, in Samuel. So we start off in Samuel, First Samuel one one. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim. Now this is Ramathaim Sophim is shortened to Ramah. Ramah is not related to Ramallah, but it is near there, and it is just about twenty miles or so north of Jerusalem, maybe a little bit less, maybe about fifteen miles north of Jerusalem. Now that's important to remember this. Where is Samuel's family from? They are from Ramah. Okay? Now, if you are a an observant student of the text, and you start reading in 1 Samuel 1, you go, you know, that's a little bit of an unusual way to state things in that first verse. There was a certain man of a place. That sounds kind of formulaic. Well, actually, there are four other places where you have a similar line. And this isn't something that is chosen just by accident. It just isn't a stylistic thing that uh, the writer of First Samuel uh, came up with. The Bible, let's just review something a minute. The Hebrew Bible is divided into three sections. You have the, everybody here ought to be able to tell this, tell me this. You have the Torah, you have the Nevi'im, the prophets, the Torah is the law or instruction, the Nevi'im are the prophets, and the Ketuvim are the writings. That's how it's organized. The prophets are broken down into two categories, the former prophets and the latter prophets. The former prophets are comprised of the books of Joshua, Judges. What comes next? Samuel. See, in the English Bible, they put Ruth in between. But if you're reading it in the Hebrew Bible, Ruth isn't there. So you would read Judges 21, and then you'd go right into 1 Samuel 1. If you do that, you would catch, you'd be more likely to catch what I just pointed out, and you'd be more likely to say, you know, that that, there's there's a certain tone to that first line that I've heard before recently. And so this isn't by... Uh, just uh, just coincidence. The writers of Scripture, who wrote, who wrote Judges? Anybody know? No, you don't. We don't know who wrote Judges. It was likely written by Samuel or one of the prophets associated with Samuel. Who wrote 1 Samuel? Who wrote the beginning part of the book of Samuel? Because remember, it was written as one book. Who wrote the beginning part of Samuel? Probably Samuel. We don't know for sure, but you have Samuel and Gad and Nathan, and these are the major prophets in Israel during this period of Saul, uh, David, and, uh, and Solomon. And these guys would have overseen the collection of the information under inspiration of the Spirit and the writing of these, of these books. So it's not just haphazard that there are certain things there, and they make uh, great literature. They make great literature, and great literature is filled with conflict. It's filled with high drama. It grabs your attention. There's conflict and conflict resolution. There's also foreshadowing, and there's parallelism. I love reading a great murder mystery, but if you're a careful reader of a murder mystery, you may not catch all the clues as to who done it. But you're going to know certain things through the foreshadowing that's indicated as you're reading through the book. That's what makes great literature. And when you look at the at the scripture, this is great literature. It has high drama, and it also has a a lot of foreshadowing. So that there are things that are happening in Judges that are foreshadowing things that are happening in Samuel. And there's parallels between things that happen in Samuel and things that happen in in the book of the Judges. It's very likely that as that Samuel was the author of of the book of Judges as well as the first part of Samuel. In any case, the writer was uh, inspired by God the Holy Spirit. And the books of first and second Samuel presuppose that you, the reader, are fully aware of the information that's in the book of Judges. Otherwise, some of the things that are stated in Samuel won't make sense. You won't catch some of the connections uh, that are being drawn. 
So the writer of Samuel is developing certain themes as well as vocabulary from Judges, which he uses to tell the stories of Samuel and uh, Saul and then uh, David. And so there are certain connections that are made through the use of language and phrases like this line, there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim that you run into at the beginning that are drawing certain connections, making us focus on uh, connections to Samson, whose uh, story is told in Judges 13 through 16, and this uh, individual Micah and his uh, his priest that he hires and his cult that he started that's described in Judges 17 and 18. Also, at the end of Judges, we're told the stories of these two priests, these two Levites. We're told the story of the Levite that is hired by, by Micah to run this little cult out of his house in Judges 17 and 18. And then there's this other Levite who both of whom have connections in Bethlehem as well as in the hill country of Ephraim, the second priest who's connected uh, by, by his, uh, uh, his concubine and the situation that develops, which is just one of the, the most tragic and atrocious things that takes place in the, in the Old Testament, one of the darkest episodes in Israel's history that leads to a bloody civil war that almost annihilates the tribe of Benjamin. And yet, the way the story is told, both of these episodes with these two priests, we're left with so, sort of surprise uh, endings in both of them. Uh, and that's there for a purpose. So let's just start looking at some of these things. Samuel, First Samuel 1 1 says, There's a certain man of Ramathaim, Zophim. Now we go back to the last part of Judges, and in the story of Samuel, Samson, Shimshon is his name in Hebrew, Shimshon. The story of Samson in Judges 13 2, we're told, Now there was a certain man from Zorah. Now, there's a definite connection that the writer of Samuel wants you to pay attention to. There are parallels, comparisons and contrasts between Samson and uh, Samuel. And I'll look at those in just a minute. Judges 17, 1 starts, Now, there was a man of the hill country of Ephraim. You know, most of that reads exactly the same in each place in the, in the Hebrew. Judges 17, 7, as that story develops, shifts from the there was a man in the hill country of Ephraim to there was a young man from Bethlehem in Judah. This is this Levitical priest. And then in Judges 19, 1, 17 and 18 are one story. 19, 20 and 21 are a second story. And that begins uh, that there was a certain Levite. So this is the only time in the Old Testament we have this kind of language set up, this, this phraseology. And so it's not by accident. The writer of 1 Samuel 1.1 1, 1 wants you to connect the dots back to what was going on in Israel at the end of this, this particular period. So let's talk about this first one. Why the connection to Samson? Well, let's, let's uh, compare them a little bit. Let's talk about Samson. Samson was, had his birth announced by the angel of the Lord. It's a miraculous birth because his mother was barren. His birth is announced uh, by the angel of the Lord, but Samuel, you know, if you, I, I was going to make a chart of this today, but I had a printer problem, and that took away my time to make this chart. So you, you should divide your notes in a column, put Saul on one, I mean, uh, Sam, Samson on one side, Samuel on the other, uh, Samson had his birth announced by the angel of the Lord. There was no announcement in relation to Samuel's birth. Remember, his mother's under a lot of pressure, so she just goes to the temple and bargains with God, prays to God to give her a son. Both of their parents are barren. Samson's mother is barren, can't have a child. Samuel's mother is barren, can't have a child. Both of them are going to be lifelong Nazarites. Now, the Nazarite was a person who took a specific vow in the Old Testament. That vow is described in Numbers 6, uh, verses 2 to 21. Numbers 6, 2 to 21. And in Judges 13, 7, we're told specifically that the angel of the Lord instructed uh, Samson's mother, be Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now drink no wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean. 
For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. From birth to death, from womb to tomb, he's going to be a Nazarite. In 1 Samuel 1.11, uh, in her vow to God, Hannah says, No razor will touch his hair. He's going to be a Nazarite. Now, in the Nazarite vow, there were about four things that were significant. They were not just to abstain from wine. They weren't to touch a grape. They weren't to touch a vine. They weren't to come into contact with anything related to grape, grape juice, a vine, the vineyard, or wine at all. They were to uh, completely abstain from that. Second, they were to refrain from cutting their hair or shaving. They were to let their beard grow completely and their hair grow without ever cutting it. Third, they were prohibited from eating anything unclean, from violating the, the laws of kashrut in the Mosaic law, the dietary laws. And fourth, they were not to touch anything that had died. They couldn't touch anything whatsoever that had died uh, at all. And so those are the four conditions, the four, the four fundamental issues in the Nazarite vow. So both of them are to be lifelong Nazarites. We're told that uh, Sam, uh, both of them were blessed of God. Uh, Samson, we're told, grew before God. Uh, uh, Samson, and he was blessed of God. We're told that uh, that Sa- Samuel was also blessed of God. God appeared to him and revealed things to him in, in the uh, fourth chapter, third chapter, and uh, fourth chapter of, uh, of of First Samuel. Both are endued with the Spirit of God. Both are endued with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God comes upon Samuel, I mean, excuse me, Samson in Judges 13.25, comes upon uh, Samson 13.25. The Spirit of God comes uh, upon Samson in 1 Samuel, uh, comes upon Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 4. But there, that's some of the similarities. But one of the differences is that Samson consistently violates his Nazarite vow. One of the first examples of this is he comes to his parents and he demands them to let him uh, take this Canaanite girl from Tem- uh, uh, Philistine girl from Timnah and, and to marry her. And so he's, he, he's going to intermarry with the Canaanites. That's a violation of the Mosaic Law. Uh, to get to her home in Timnah, he travels through the vineyards. Now, remember, he's not supposed to touch a grape or touch a vine or have anything to do with the fruit of the vine. So he travels through the vineyards. So he is... A callous about the obe- the, about obeying his his vow. He doesn't just break his Nazarite vow when he tells Delilah and she cuts his hair off. He's been violating his Nazarite vow almost his whole adult life. Uh, when he's going on the way to Timnah to see this uh, uh, Philistine uh, uh, young lady. Uh, he's met with a lion. The Holy Spirit comes upon him, gives him the power to kill the lion. And when he comes back a little while later, that something miraculous has happened that instead of that flesh just rotting in a, in a mass of goo, it's hardened and almost petrified, which is very unusual. And bees have taken up residence inside that hardened flesh and produced honey. Now that takes a process, so there's no rotting of the flesh in that carcass. And, uh, and he stops and he digs into the carcass. What's he doing? He's violating the third part of that vow. He's touching, or the fourth part, he's touching the dead. And it may be that because this honey is inside of a carcass, that may render it un- unclean because it's touching a dead thing. So he's violating uh, his, his, uh, uh, the, the law of what he should eat. Uh, furthermore, later on, he's going to kill a bunch of Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. That jawbone is part of a carcass. Again, he's violating his uh, Nazarite vow. And then he goes to a Philistine prostitute in Gaza a few times. And then again, he's hot for Delilah, who's another Philistine woman. So he's just violating the law and violating his vow over and over again. He's a womanizer. He, he treats God casually. He's abusive toward his parents. He's abusive towards the women in his life. There's nothing positive stated about Samson in the book of Judges. If you want to see something positive stated about Samson, you have to go to Hebrews 11. But the picture here that the writer of Judges wants us to understand is this guy is a spiritual failure. But at the end of his life, when he's in prison by the Philistines uh, down in Gaza, 
There he, he calls upon the Lord to give him the strength to destroy them, and that's the only act of faith and obedience to God uh, in his life. Uh, he was to deliver Israel from the Philistines, but he failed. At the beginning of Judges, the people have, have conquered uh, the le- promised land. At the end of the book, they're under the thumb and the domination of the Philistines. He was unfaithful to God. In contrast, Sam, Samuel keeps his vow. Uh, he witnessed the defeat of the nation by the Philistines when they captured the Ark of God. But later on, he saw that God gave Israel victory over the, over the Philistines. And he would anoint David, who would be the one who eventually completely defeated uh, the Philistines and freed Israel from that uh, domination. Samuel, in contrast to Samson, uh, was faithful to God, and he's the catalyst for bringing about this spiritual and political renewal in Israel. And so that gives us this contrast. The writer of Samuel specifically wants us to contrast Samuel and his life as a Nazarite with Samson. Remember, they live almost at the same time. Their lives overlapped. And so he wants us to get that that particular point. Um, now, I want to skip past this particular slide. I'll just leave that up there. The next thing we want to come to, Judges 13, 14 through 16, tells us the story of Sam, Sam, Samson. And then we come to chapter 17. Chapter 17 tells us a story about Micah. Now, this is a fascinating little story. He is uh, an individual who has this pseudo-religious framework. He has a name, Micah Yahoo. Uh, that would be the long form, uh, which uh, says that he is related to, you know, to God. He has the name of Yahweh in his name, and so he has this veneer of, uh, uh, of obedience to God, but he, the shortened form is Micah, and he's anything but obedient to God. He is a thief, and he is uh, an idolater, and he is uh, totally, again, he has a abusive relationship with his mother and I pointed this out that what we see in paganism is that women become more and more abused uh, as a result of the complete distortion of values so we see the first picture of him as he steals 1100 shekels of silver from his mother now that's a sizable sum when Delilah betrayed Samson she wants as her reward 1,100 shekels of silver from each of the five lords of, of the Philistines. A shekel uh, was weighed about weighed four tenths of an ounce, and so 1,100 shekels would be four, uh, 440 ounces uh, at today's price of silver, about 7,000 uh, U.S. dollars. What's interesting, if you read through the story, when he hires this, leave, this unnamed Levitical priest, he says, I'm going to pay you 10 shekels a year. Now that gives you 10 shekels a year was something the priest could live on. So 1,100 shekels a year, that's a tremendous sum. So he steals this money, then he goes back and he kind of confesses and tells, tells his mother. And so she says in a very religious way, well, I'm going to dedicate this to the Lord. She says, blessed be the Lord, my son. You're so great. You came back and confessed and gave me back my money. So we'll dedicate the money to the Lord. She gives 200 shekels to her son which is about six pounds of silver, to make an idol. See, she's really focused on the Lord, isn't she? Blessed be the Lord. Let's go make an idol. So I'm going to give you 200 shekels. Well, she had dedicated all 1,100, so I guess the other 900 was going to pay uh, this priest eventually that they got. So he, he builds this little, he starts his own cult, and he builds his own little worship center there. And he builds the, all the other accoutrements. He makes some teraphim, and he makes an ephod, and all the things necessary to uh, start his own little religion. And then he takes one of his sons, and he makes him a priest. Verse 5, he consecrated one of his sons. So that would make Micah probably in his, what, 40s? Maybe he's a little older. I think the age thing here is worth paying attention to. He's, he's probably in his 40s, and he has sons that are probably anywhere from 15 to 25. So he makes one of them the priest. So he's made his own little religion. And then we're reminded right after that in verse 6, in those days there's no king in Israel. Everyone's doing what's right in his own eyes. Get the point? Micah is a pure relativist. 
And then we're told in verse 7, now there was a young man from Bethlehem in Judah, a young man. I want to pay attention to that. He's a na'ar, which means a young man, probably 20 to 25. A young man in uh, Beth from Bethlehem. Now, you're reading this, David's king. What are you thinking? Because, see, this is written at a time when it's saying there's no, there was no king in Israel at that time. So it's written later under the monarchy. It's brought to its final form. There was no king then. There's a king now. Now, if it's, you're reading this under David, you think, David's from Bethlehem. See the foreshadowing? This priest is from, from Bethlehem. And we're not told his name. He says he was a Levite and he was staying there. And the man departed from Bethlehem in Judah to stay wherever he could find a place. And he came to the mountains of Ephraim. Now, he's a Levite. Now, he's going to end up uh, with this house of Micah that's somewhere north of Jerusalem. But he doesn't go to Shiloh. If you're a priest, where, do you, where are you supposed to serve? You're supposed to serve at the, at the tabernacle. But this priest is obviously not looking to serve Yahweh in the tabernacle. He's already apostate. There's, there are these hints in the text. He's just traveling around. And he comes to Micah and he says, well, where are you from? And he says, I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah. I'm on my fa- way to find a place to stay. I'm not on the way to Shiloh to serve Yahweh. He's, I'm just looking around. Micah says, well, come live with me and be a priest to me and my family, and I will pay you ten shekels of silver a year. I'll, pay you, I'll buy you a suit of clothes and your sustenance. I'll take care of all your logistical needs and pay you ten shekels a year, and you be my little private priest. And the Levite says, that sounds like a good deal. Now, what's interesting is we're not told this guy's name. He's going to build suspense, because what's important is who this guy is. And we know he's important because later on when the, in the next chapter, when this recon team from the tribe of Dan comes by and they hear the priest talk, they recognize his voice. They know who he is. So he's not just some anonymous little priest that has no significance. Now in the next chapter, what we read is, again, we're reminded in verse 1. Remember, there's no king in Israel. Now, the Danites are living down here. They've never been able to take their territory, so they, they're frustrated. They can't go forward. No prosperity, no land. So they decide to send out five men as a recon team to go find a place that will be their inheritance. And so they go up to the mountains of Ephraim. That's the hill country north of Jerusalem and up into, into Samaria, what we call the northern part of the West Bank today. And they find Micah. And they recognize, verse 4 says, they recognize the voice of the young Levite. And they say, well, who brought you here? What are you doing here? What, what's going on? And he said, well, this is what I did for Micah. And, he, you know, he's got a nice little religious gig going here, and he hired me. And so we've got our own little cult going here. And so they thought that was uh, pretty interesting. They said, well, go inquire of God. Notice it's not Yahweh, it's Elohim, uh, generic God that we may know whether the journey we go on will be prosperous. And like any good uh, person who's pulling a hoax, he's going to come back and say, yeah, God's blessing you. You're going to have a successful journey. So they headed on up north in Israel, way up north to uh, the area of Laish, which is Dan. You've been with me to Israel. You know we've been up there to, to tell Dan. We've been up there and seen the uh, Canaanite gate from Laish at that particular time. And so they go up there and they say, well, these people are from Sidon. They're sort of an outpost, a colony. But the Sidonites haven't sent any security forces over here. They don't have a militia. They don't have a police department. They're easy pickings. We're going to go back and tell everybody else in the tribe of Dan that we can uh, take control here. So they went back home and told everybody, and they put together a uh, reconnaissance in force that would go and wipe out the uh, inhabitants of Laish. And on their way back, they're, they're going back to this area where Micah and his priest and their little cult are operating. <coughs> when they get there, the five men who had been the original recon team sort of sneak up and they, they tap this priest on the shoulder and they say, you know, you got a nice little gig here, but, but nobody knows who you are. Uh, you've so, sort of disappeared off the radar. You're not on the front page anymore. But if you go with us, 
you can be a you can set up your your idol and you can set up your religious base up where we're headed and you can be a priest to the whole tribe of Dan. And he thinks that's that's pretty good, so they sneak off, and Micah tries to catch up with him, but they bully him and threaten him, and so he turns back, and they they head up to uh, to to Laish, and they're going to make this Levite their um, their priest. Now we're finally told who this Levite is in verse thirty. Then the children of Dan set up for themselves the carved image. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom. Now we get his name. He's Jonathan. He's the son of Gershom. And then, and see, the, the, the Masoretic text just messed this all up because they had to change the name because they didn't like the implications. So they inserted an N in between the M and the S. So if you have M, S, you've got the name Moshe. But you put an N in the middle, you have the name Manesha. And that's what they says. This is Jonathan, the son of Ger- Gershom, the son of Manesha. That's not what the Septuagint and the Vulgate and other older manuscripts say. The Masoretic text is the only one that says Manasseh. The, all the others have the original reading, I believe. This is Jonathan, the grandson of Moses. Jonathan, the son of Gershom, who's the son of Moses. This guy's got a real heritage. You know, you you set up the grandson of Moses as your priest, you're doing something. That's why his voice was recognized by the men from Dan. He was somebody, and they knew who he was. And so he's setting up this cult. What this is showing, what the writer of Judges is saying, is how extensive this the perversion and the more relativism was in Israel the priesthood and the, even the, had become corrupt even to the point of corrupting the family of Moses now who's a levite <clears throat> eli's a levite he's the high priest and his two perverted sons hophni and phinehas see how this is setting us up to understand at the beginning of samuel why we have such such corruption then we come to chapter 19, and I'm going to really go through this fast because I want to tie it together. You have another Levite. This Levite <coughs> is from the uh, remote mountains of Ephraim, Ephraim in the Hebrew, and he takes a concubine who's kind of, she's, sort, she, she's treated like a wife, but she is a woman of incredibly loose morals. And he takes her from Bethlehem, and she comes back, and the first thing she does is she starts sleeping around with everybody. She plays the harlot against him, and she leaves him, and she goes back to his father's house in Bethlehem in Judah. And she's there for four months, and he says, you know, enough of this, I'm going to go down and get her. So he goes down, and his father-in-law says, well, let's have a party. And so they party for three days, and then he's going to leave on the fourth day, but the father-in-law starts getting him drunk early in the morning, and so they party all day, and he says, no, I'm not going to leave. On the fifth day, he wakes up, and the father-in-law tries to pull the same stunt again. He says, no, I'm not going to do that. I've got to leave, but he does delays them enough to where they get away late in the morning. And so by the time it's getting dark and it's time to rest, they're up near Jerusalem. Jerusalem at this time was still held by the Jebusites, and it's pagan. He doesn't want to stay in a pagan town because if he stays in a pagan town, something bad might happen. So we need to press on and stay in a town controlled by Jews. So the options are either Ramah or Gibeah. Now, that's going to resonate with people. When you think of Bethlehem, who do you think of? David. When you think of Ramah, who do you think of? Your memory is short. Ramah is short for Ramathaim, the home of Elkanah and Hannah and Penina. Uh, eventually, it'll be their home where, where uh, Samuel's from. What about Gibeah? Well, after we get halfway through Samuel, Gibeah will almost always be known as Gibeah of Saul. Okay, so his two options are to go to Ramah, which will be the eventual home of Samuel. So if you're reading this 200 years later, you're going to say, oh, he's going to go to Samuel's home or he's going to go to Saul's home. Which is he going to do? Well, he's going to go to Gibeah. 
But he goes to Gibeah. Now this story sounds like something out of out of Genesis. It sounds just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Go back. I go through all the technicalities in the Judges series. The, the similarities in vocabulary between this chapter and Genesis 19 are incredible. It, it's the same kind of situation. They get in there late at night. They're going to camp out in the city square. An old guy in town comes up and says, what are you all going to do? And they said, well, we're just going to camp out here. He says, no, whatever you do, you can't stay here. Here. He says, come to my house. This is too dangerous for you to camp out here. So they go to his house. He fixes dinner. And then they get this pounding on the door. And all the perverted homosexuals in town have gathered outside his house because they're bored with their sex life because they've all been with all the same guys for so many years. They want fresh meat. And this guy's there. And so they want to have a gangbang rape on him all night long. And then this old man who's protected him says, no, you can't do that to my guest. Take my virgin daughter. Now, isn't this great? I mean, this just shows how perverted the culture has become. Take my virgin daughter and take his concubine. Give up the women. You know, women and children first and then the men, right? Okay, that's his motto. This just shows how perverted they've gotten. And so they take the concubine and they have a gang rape all night long, and the next morning she finally gets away from him, just has enough life left in her to drag herself to the door of this house, and she dies on the doorstep. How tragic. Now, the Levite, this guy gets the award for being the most most sensitive guy in the world. He comes out and he says, get up, let's leave. Of course, she doesn't move because she's already dead. But he's totally insensitive to this. He's had a good night's sleep while she's out getting raped. It just shows how horrid the culture is. So he now is incensed at what's happened here in Israel, what they've done to me. So he cuts her body up into 12 parts for the 12 tribes of Israel. He sends out a message with each part, and he says, we've got to do something about this perversion in Benjamin. So the the rest of the tribes send men. They take 10% of them, and they send an army to Benjamin. And they have this huge battle that lasts for three or four days. And this is described in chapter 20, this war against, uh, against the Benjamites. And so as they, uh, as they uh, get engaged in this, there are, um, uh, there, there's these battles that take place. And on the first day, Benjamin is successful and kills 22,000 Israelites. On the second day, he kills 18,000. What do the, the rest of the Israelites do now? Now they go to the Lord. Now they go up to Shiloh, and they pray, and they fast, and they offer burnt offerings and peace offerings, and they inquire of God what to do. And now God says, through Phinehas, the grandson of Aaron, go to battle tomorrow, and you'll win. So the next day they went to battle, and the Israelites slaughtered 25,100 Benjamites. Then the next day they slaughtered 25,000 more, and then another undetermined number, including women and children. Now, what happened is, as they sent out the call to everybody, they said, anybody who doesn't show up, we're going to come and we're going to wipe you out. We're going to kill everybody. So everybody came except from one town, Jabesh Gilead. So what happens after this battle, they made everybody swear an oath that they wouldn't give their daughters to the Benjamites. So after this big slaughter, they've killed women and children and all these Benjamites. They've got a lot of young Benjamites who can't get married. Because no other Jews will give them any of their daughters to marry. So what are we going to do? Now they live to regret their rash oath like Jephthah did. So they say, well, did anybody not show up? Well, the people from Jabesh Gilead didn't show up. Well, we've got to slaughter them because that's what the oath was. But before we kill everybody in Jabesh Gilead, let's find out how many virgin young women there are. We will let them live so they can marry the Benjamites because they didn't swear an oath. And we're going to go kill everybody else. So they went up and they slaughtered everybody at Jabesh Gilead except for 400 uh, young virgins. They gave them as wives to Benjamin. Isn't this a lovely place to live? That's where Samuel begins. Israel has become more corrupt, more perverted than the Canaanites ever were. We've got a long way to go in the United States, folks. Things may appear hopeless. But they're a long way from rock bottom. God's grace is still as sufficient today as it was then. 
And the hope that we have is still the same hope, the rock of our salvation. God is still the one who can change things. But people need to hear the gospel. They need to hear the light of the word. And that's our responsibility. As Paul says to the Philippians in Philippians 2, we are to shine as lights in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation. And that's what we need to do. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to go through this material this evening and to uh, reflect upon what you have to teach us and the reason you have revealed this to us, to recognize the horrors of sin, the horrors of of, uh, of relativism, the horrors of paganism, how it destroys a culture, how it destroys people, and that the only hope is to turn to you, and the only hope is salvation through the Messianic King who's represented by David but focuses on Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our only hope and the only hope for the world and the only hope for this nation. And we pray that you might give us a passion to give the gospel to those who are lost. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.